Uh, well, uh, thank you, Andrew, for a very nice introduction. Uh, really excited to be here. This will be my first MSU talk outside of my home institute, the uh, IQ Institute for Quantitative Health Science and Engineering and Biomedical Engineering. So this is uh, this is pretty exciting. Uh, really delighted to be here. Uh, and thank you all for being here on a cold uh, late on a cold afternoon. Uh, so uh, instead of uh, talking about uh, uh, giving a full story of a nicely completed, uh, finished, wrapped up project, uh, I thought I would uh, throw out a set of maybe provocative, hopefully interesting ideas uh, that I'm working on. Um, uh, this is uh, very much exploratory work, but I would love to hear what all of you, all of you think here in the room. So uh, uh, I'll start with this uh, picture of this. Uh, this lovely creature is the, is the Panamanian golden frog. Uh, uh, sadly, it has virtually disappeared. Uh, starting in the in from the nineteen uh, around the nineteen eighties, there was a, a, a there was a, a disease that spread through uh, a fungal disease spread through most of uh, Central America and South America and pretty much wiped out the species in a, in kind of in a way. Um, the, so on the right, you can see a sort of a globe. It's not it's true, not just this species, but amphibian species uh, collectively throughout the world. And this is uh, the graph on the right uh, is a plot of uh, amphibian species worldwide, um, and you can see the decline. Uh, yeah, I do. Have, okay, thank you. This. Uh, this other creature on the top left is the, the so-called little brown bat. It's an North American species. Um, this was native to the to the uh, to the U.S. Northeast. Uh, again, uh, 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 this uh, disease called white nose syndrome. This is white patches on, this, uh, on the bat. Um, the starting uh, in the in the Adirondacks, it sort of the, this disease spread out in a wave uh, across sort of more or less tracking the Appalachians and further up north. Um, the, this species has also uh, dropped, a uh, remarkable drop in the, in the population of the species. So lest you think that these, are, uh, these disappearances are uh, just exclusively a modern phenomenon, um, uh, actually uh, this is uh, uh, as, uh, this ostrich-like creature is called the moa, uh, and their, uh, their this rapid disappearance had to do with the arrival of the Maori in New Zealand in the 30th century. Um, so, uh, this is not just an exclusively industrial age phenomenon, but it's definitely an, uh, an anthropogenic uh, human cause, uh, cause phenomenon. Uh, the, the World Wildlife Fund uh, issues this report called the Living Planet Report periodically, and this, these are figures from, from, the, from their latest uh, report. Uh, the Global uh, Living Planet Index uh, is a measure of, of global uh, species richness. And you can see a uh, overall a 58% drop from between 1970 and 2010. Uh, for just for freshwater uh, species, this drop, the corresponding drop in the same period was about 81%. So uh, this is all uh, part of uh, um, part of a global phenomenon. This has been uh, this has been uh, dubbed uh, the sixth mass extinction. Uh, and uh, from the fossil record, it appears that there have been at least five prior uh, mass extinction events of this, of this kind. Uh, this is the subject of a, of a the Pulitzer Prize winning book, The Sixth Extinction, by the journalist Elizabeth Colbert. She first wrote an essay in the New Yorker on the topic, and that was later extended into a book. This is very much a paper of the PIS, very much an active area of research. Um, so why am I showing you pictures of uh, frogs and bats? And what does any of this got to do with toxicology, which is, uh, which as Andrea said, an introduction is my uh, uh, my purported uh, to, uh, topic of uh, area of research. Um, so uh, this uh, the link to these phenomena is where uh, in toxicology, we believe this is the uh, sort of idea we're working on, uh, is provided by this paper that appeared in Nature in 2009, Early Warning Signals for Critical Transitions. This was by an ecologist, uh, Martin Sheffer, uh, uh, and he is Dutch, and a bunch of co-workers from various fields. Um, and they laid out a very compelling case in this paper that uh, abrupt transitions like mass extinction events, uh, abrupt depending on you know, the time scale of the disappearance would depend on what scale of biology or a natural or social or economical system you're looking at. Uh, but uh, these abrupt changes are often overlaid by dynamics which can be described as these bifurcation curves where the system is uh, happily uh, at a steady state over a certain range of conditions, but then a subtle change in condition can change, can send it hurtling towards a completely different steady state. 
Uh, so it's a very abrupt switch-like transition. And if you reverse the conditions, it will it is not necessarily reversible at the same uh, at the same uh, switching condition. Uh, it may or may not be reversible, and if so, if reversible, then the reverse switch may happen in a different way. So uh, the, this uh, Shepard also wrote a book the same year, uh, Critical Transitions in Nature and Society, which kind of goes into their hypothesis in, in much greater detail. So uh, the central question in toxicology, and, uh, and Lawrence Olivier's immortal words in the movie Marathon Man is, is it safe, uh, right? And you're always asking our, um, our uh, exposures to, to environmental chemicals, to drugs, and is it in some sort of safe level? Uh, and we believe that this critical transition theory can, uh, can inform um, predictions of when a biological system is approaching uh, an unsafe or, or un unhealthy state, right? So going back to that bifurcation diagram from Shepard's paper, if you think of the, the upper level, the upper steady state as some sort of a healthy cellular state, you might have a, you could see that kind of progressive gradual changes can set in motion this abrupt transition to an unhealthy cellular state. So this is, I'm sort of proposing a hypothesis that we may be able to um, think of a biological system as occupying a, a healthy cellular state and an unhealthy cellular state with transitions between the two. By the way, feel free to stop me with questions. Uh, you know, just, just want to answer that. So, um, Biological systems, much like other, much like uh, other mechanical systems, uh, can be part of as occupying um, a, a landscape. So this is think of this as some sort of a gene expression landscape on which a cell resides. Um, typically, when a cell is at a healthy, stable state, it's uh, uh, these these states can, can be described as these sort of deep, low-lying valleys on this landscape. And um, I'll talk about this uh, landscape for a cell, uh, the so-called epigenetic landscape, in uh, a few slides further down in more detail. But uh, think of this as, as the cell is sort of happily residing in this healthy state. And for the patients, if you try to push the cell um, uh, in, in some direction or the other, uh, it's because of this, the steepness and narrowness of this valley, it doesn't really have much room for, for, uh, uh, for, uh, for oscillations or, or, or for duration. So if you sort of pull the cell up a little bit, it will rapidly fall back to its original condition, the steady state, the same steady state. Now, if you alter this value in some way by an external perturbation and make it, you can imagine kind of a force pushing this, uh, the, pushing the basin of the valley upwards, um, and the, the cell, at some level of the perturbation, the cell is likely to roll into an adjacent valley, which may, which may uh, describe, which may correspond to a different cellular state. So this could be a cellular different differentiation process, maybe a free adipocyte turning into an adipocyte, a hematopoietic stem cell turning into a, a lymphoid specified fate, or so forth, or it could be a transition between an unhealthy, between a healthy and an unhealthy state, where kind of a state where you don't want the a state that you don't want the cell to occupy. But before the transition, uh, this as the external perturbation makes this valley, uh, the, makes this healthy or uh, the the first valley more and more shallow. The cell can oscillate more and more in this in this original valley, right? Because of the shallowness, if you push the cell, it will um, it will be slower because the, the, the slope of the of this valley is now much lower. It, it will return to its original steady state much more slowly. There's there's much more room for for sort of these noisy oscillations in the original valley. This basic idea. Uh, uh, is often described as critical slowing down. That was, that was the term that Shepard used in the Nature paper. So just before abrupt transitions from one valley to another, uh, this critical slowing down phenomenon um, can be manifested in a number of ways. So let's say um, this was the uh, this is this line represents the the variable of interest that you're tracking. This could be the population of a species for an ecological system. This could be a gene of interest if you're monitoring cellular health. Um, the idea is that uh, uh, before we, uh, at, a, at this particular abrupt transition, of course, there would be a, uh, there would be this uh, sudden change between uh, sort of the upper stable, the upper steady state and the lower steady state. But if you looked at just at the residual, if you subtracted the um, kind of the, uh, the the gradient of this from from the time course uh, of your variable, uh, this 
you would see the, the critical slowing down phenomenon would be manifested as greater fluctuations in the residual just before the transition happens. Further, this greater fluctuation would be reflected in um, um, an abrupt change in the, in the standard deviation. So the standard deviation would sharply increase before the critical transition. And this other function called the autocorrelation uh, would also sharply increase before the transition. So the autocorrelation function uh, is best thought of as simply a statistical correlation between the value of the variable at one particular time point with the value of the same variable at a previous time point. And you calculate that correlation function uh, over a sliding window uh, over the time course, right? So, this, uh, so with a simple model, Shepard all showed that this autocorrelation function and the variance will both sharply increase before a transition. So this is kind of an early warning signal that a major, uh, that a major uh, uh, abrupt critical transition is about to happen. Now, for certain, certain scenarios, in, for instance, a particular uh, biological transition, we may not be aware of what, if it's a, uh, if it's a transition in cell fate, uh, we, might not, we might not know a priori what, which gene would show this particular trend. Right, so in that case, we can do it. We can uh, uh, we can we can uh, do a, a kind of a screening study to, to show to see if particular groups of genes show this trend uh, or not, and 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 we think that that could be an approach to to screen out uh, potential predictive biomarkers of a major transition. And I'll have more to say on that. So. Um, so although this idea of the critical state transitions is a few years old, um, uh, in, the, in the cell biology field, only in the last two or three years, uh, a set of papers have begun to come out applying these ideas. Um, and uh, Sui Huang and all, uh, and then co-workers uh, uh, applied this idea to a study of uh, cell differentiation in the hematopoietic stem cell lineage. Um, other, other authors have, uh, have applied it to, to uh, trying to predict the disease biology. But still, very much uh, early days in applying this theory to uh, to cell biology. So um, I, I I kind of sketched out this idea of the uh, of, of a landscape. Um, uh, is this picture familiar? How many people people in this room are familiar with this picture? Okay, several, quite a few. So this famous picture uh, dates back to the 1940s when the a British embryologist Conrad Waddington proposed that uh, the so-called epigenetic landscape. A sort of a visual metaphor for cellular differentiation and lineage, uh, lineage branching in cells. So the idea is that this ball rolling down a series of uh, rolling down this hilly landscape uh, represents a developing cell, which is faced with a series of branching decisions in, in morphogenesis. Right. So kind of do I go this way or that way? Um, so if this is a say a, a hematopoietic stem cell, uh, do I become myeloid or lymphoid? Then the next decision you face is do I become a maybe a B cell or a T cell? The myeloid becomes a, a macrophage or a red blood cell and so forth, right? So these series of branching uh, decision points, and this is as sort of a visual metaphor for, for that process. Now, Waddington and others after him cautioned that look, this is this is just a picture, right? right? I mean, don't read too much into this. Uh, uh, that that's all there is to it. It's just a kind of a nice. Uh, picture for an idea. However, um, we did some work, uh, this is uh, while I was in North Carolina at the Hammer Institute, uh, which uh, uh, we, we, we showed that this is actually more than just, uh, just an idea. Uh, we modeled a simple cellular differentiation process where uh, uh, a precursor cell, say a hematopoietic stem cell, goes into one of two uh, alternative lineages. So these blue cells, let's say these are, uh, this is the lymphoid cells, these are myeloid cells. So you have these, uh, this valley in the, in the middle is uh, our precursor cells that can go this way or that way. Um, if you, now, if you know the interactions of the, of the key transcription factors and genes regulating this transition, regulating the switch between the blue and the, uh, the red becoming, uh, the red cells becoming either blue cells or green cells, uh, you can actually model that with a simple set of differential equations. This is, uh, this is just a two gene system. X and Y both uh, mutually inhibit each other, and they also activate themselves. Um, and by a reasonably simple set of differential equations, if you model this, we could derive um, a potential energy-like term. So this is not a mechanical system, of course. 
So it's not technically a potential energy, but we, we call it a, a quasi-potential or potential-like term. And we showed that you can actually develop a, a trajectory uh, along which the, the, the potential is, uh, uh, the change in the potential is always negative. In other words, if you mapped out this trajectory, the potential and the potential would always decrease uh, along, along as with decrease with time. So we, what we did was then we aligned these those uh, uh, aligned those trajectories from different initial conditions to to map out this landscape. So this was a very much a theoretically derived landscape, but with stochastic cellular simulations. Uh, we showed that indeed these low-lying valleys correspond to more, uh, uh, more uh, 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 higher occupancy of cells. So, uh, so these blue, each blue, blue dot is a stochastically simulated cell. But as you can see, the low-lying valleys are well populated, whereas the higher sort of the ridges separating the, the valleys, which represent some sort of energetic barrier between these uh, between these cell types, uh, are are not not well populated. So the, it's, it's much like a mechanical system, uh, the cells would tend to settle at, at lower values. Michael? Uh, so yeah. most uh, cells don't have these positive feedback loops where the, uh, the X would stimulate itself and the Y would stimulate. That would be happening only in full expansion of immune cells and cancer cells do that also. Um, but do you have a similar model for something where, where you have a Feedback, so it turns itself off. That, that's a good question. So just to clarify, these X and Ys refer to not to individual cells, but rather to individual genes in a cell. Yeah. So um, this this motif uh, of two two let's say two regulatory transcription factors inhibiting each other, along with positive auto uh, positive auto activation, is uh, turns out to be remarkably common in transcriptional regulators that uh, govern a switch. Let's say of the kind that would um, uh, an erythrocyte versus a macrophage phase specification. That's the U1 GATA1 switch. They follow this motif. Um, uh, P1 and Notch, I believe, is another B versus T cell switch where you also see this motif where the two transcription factors uh, inhibit each other and activate themselves. So wherever you have these branching decision points, this motif actually happens to be very, very common. In, in not even in normal physiology. But that's, that's so a good point. Would you Andrea? find that, for example, when there's lineage of, um, let's say, different neuron, neurons or stuff like that, would you find it similar decision? Uh, we, we would expect to find find a very, this, this sort of motif in, in pretty much any branching decision. Um, at least all that have been looked at quantitatively, there was there was some factor, there, were, there was a pair of factors that, that you know, had followed this motif and govern a switch. So essentially, I mean, it's a, it's a ratchet that once one factor is favored, it, it then sort of locks itself in place and shuts down the other development path in that way. That's, that's a perfect description. So these could happen, so the input, you have to sort of think of it as a seesaw, you have to put your weight on one, of the, on one side, and immediately, you know, that one gets shut off and the other one gets activated. And this could happen from uh, a morphogenic signal, or even by uh, by just a stochastic noisy gene expression. Once uh, one of these pathways sets is set in motion, the feedback ensures that the alternative pathway is shut down. So furthermore, um, what so this was work uh, uh, in BMC Systems Biology uh, uh, in 2011. Uh, the, it's um, uh, the other thing to keep in mind is that these landscapes are not static, right? So uh, you can think of this as sort of, uh, I don't know, a tablecloth or a bed sheet that you are, uh, uh, that you are holding forth, uh, the holding up by the edges, and you can, the slight perturbations or, or the breeze can kind of set, uh, uh, can, uh, can alter the landscape, right? It's very dynamic. So here what we did was we uh, uh, changed the parameters of the, uh, of the, of the switch such that this part of the landscape was pushed up, so the green cells, this valley became destabilized, um, and uh, kind of uh, parallelly pulled down the, the valley containing the blue cells, and indeed all of the stochastically simulated cells sort of rolled, into, or rolled over into the blue valley. So this was sort of further demonstration that indeed the height 
of this on this quasi potential like surface means something biological at least uh, in a theoretical model and um, uh, we could uh, associate uh, uh, you know, lower heights on the landscape with more occupied states. Um, as, as you probably well know, uh, the, uh, we now know that differentiation is not just uh, sort of a unidirectional forward flowing process. Uh, Shinya Yamanaka's work in Japan, then uh, corroborated and reproduced in many different ways by others, showed that you can uh, push uh, a mature differentiated cell kind of against nature's will up along the landscape towards a, towards a, a pluripotent stem cell-like state and then redirect them along a different path to a different fate. So, uh, so there's considerable plasticity in cell fate choice. You can carefully manipulate a B cell to turn into a macrophage or vice versa. So what we think, uh, why these experiments were actually done with sort of uh, very, very painstakingly and, and with lots of trial and error about which uh, transcription factors to, to tune exquisitely and, and uh, 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 a lot of work. But we think that the underlying phenomenon that's going on is really stabilization and destabilization of different valleys on, of this epigenetic landscape. Um, you are just kind of pushing, you are making different cells, different states, different valleys, which would not be accessible in normal physiological development. By genetic manipulation, you're making different valleys accessible and pushing, letting cells sort of roll over into a different landscape. Now, of course, we don't, uh, uh, you know, nature, uh, our cells would be something, instead of a two variable system where X and Y, we'd have a 20,000 variable system uh, with, uh, with a landscape in that space, which we can't really visualize, but we should still be able to, if we can, uh, uh, the computation in, of this model was not uh, specific to two dimensions. It can be generalized to multiple dimensions. And you can always take slices along that 20,000 uh, dimensional landscape to visualize subsets or uh, projections of that landscape onto different uh, two variable systems. So, um, so what, what, does, what does that have to say with, um, uh, uh, what, what does that have to say about what, what we're doing in toxicology? Um, this is a, a picture from a preprint that we just uploaded on, on BioArchive. Here we are looking at the, the AH receptor, the aryl hydrocarbon receptor, which is one of these so-called orphan nuclear receptors that resides in the cytosol. Um, uh, one of the ligands of interest is an environmental pollutant called dioxin, uh, also of, often referred to as TCDD. So uh, it's a small lipophilic molecule which diffuses into the cell. Uh, binds the aryl hydrocarbon receptor, forms a complex. This complex then translocates to the nucleus, uh, binds uh, uh, a partner protein called the ARNT, and together these, uh, this com complex then binds uh, certain uh, response elements uh, in the promoter regions of target genes and sets it forth the whole cascade of gene expression. Uh, this basic uh, sort of canonical mechanism governs a set of primary responder genes then uh, some of the respond responding genes and themselves transcription factors, which uh, which activate other genes in turn and so forth. So it's a um, it's a fairly complex signaling cascade. But uh, these networks, we, uh, this was from a study uh, in uh, carried out by uh, Tim Zakharyski in biochemistry here at Michigan State. Uh, we took the, his data sets that he published a few years ago and carried out downstream network analysis with his data. Um, these, these data sets typically come from, uh, this was a mouse liver study, right? So mice were treated with this environmental pollutant, dioxin, the liver kind of ground up, and uh, gene expression done on the whole liver with mixed cell types. Um, what we further showed was that uh, if you, uh, you could cluster the genes by, uh, by transcriptional regulators, so here this is, a, this is a binary matrix showing genes, responsive genes along the rows, and each column corresponds to a transcription factor, and the elements of the matrix are blue or white according as whether the transcription factor binds a gene or not. Okay, so uh, the leftmost column is the H receptor, which is the, the top hub in the network. So you see uh, this cluster of genes, all of the genes in this group, uh, so we clustered the genes by transcription factor binding only. So this is, uh, I think we, here we had about 16 clusters. Um, and we looked at the gene expression uh, patterns over time of some of these, uh, uh, of some of these uh, clusters of genes. So this here is uh, uh, directly HR, uh, the H receptor bound genes. Uh, this cluster up here is mostly, you see this, this column, the first column is all white. 
So uh, none of these genes bound the H receptor, but they bound other transcription factors uh, in the cascade. And we saw very different gene expression patterns between genes that were directly bound by the H receptor, as in this cluster, and genes that were not bound by the H receptor, as in this, this cluster. So for instance, the HR bound genes were consistently highly expressed uh, over time. So, so red is high and blue is low. Um, whereas in the AHR unbound genes in cluster two, uh, most, of, most of them, if you, except for the late time points, most genes are, uh, are downregulated or expressed very slightly uh, upregulated. But there is a sharp uptick in a large group of genes at the, uh, at the latest time point. This was 168 hours or one week, where a group of genes went sharply up. Uh, but, but a very different pattern from, the, from, the, uh, from cluster two, which were AHR bound genes. So, uh, so this was the, the, the main message here was that transcriptional uh, uh, patterns of transcriptional regulation, co-bound genes, uh, co-regulated genes uh, tend to be co-expressed. So there's a link between which, what sort of transcriptional input you have into a group of genes and what's the, the output as measured by their expression. Uh, we further showed that uh, the enrichment of biological processes amongst these various clusters was also somewhat different. Um, uh, the AHR bound cluster uh, was enriched for glucuronic metabolism, uh, for instance, whereas the, uh, the AHR unbound cluster was, uh, was enriched for immune responses. And we know from other studies in the, in the Zakharovsky lab that this actually reflects an, uh, an influx of immune cells into the liver under dioxin treatment. Um, other clusters enriched for lipid biosynthesis, for example. So, so there's sort of a... Um, a, a the, there's kind of a channelization of the information flow in these uh, cell signaling and transcriptional regulatory cascades where co-regulated genes are co-expressed followed by co-enrichment of different groups of biological processes depending on which co-regulated cluster you're looking at. So um, this, I wanted to uh, include this slide just to uh, uh, it bring up the point that there's a, a lot of excitement right now about uh, single cell genomics. Over uh, last summer and fall, both Nature and Science ran special issues and, and covers on single cell genomics and single cell biology. Uh, assays, uh, the kinds of studies based on uh, bulk cell assays like, of the ones, like the ones I just showed you, these heat maps, uh, they show results from populations of cells, right? This was a whole liver, so you know, presumably the bulk of them are hepatocytes, but there are immune cells, uh, there are hepatic satellite cells, endothelial cells, all mixed in there. Even amongst the hepatocytes, we know that there's lots of heterogeneity from one part of a liver lobule to, to another. Um, so um, kind of the, the signal in terms of which genes are expressed, uh, differentially expressed, is often sort of washed out in these bulk studies. The advantage of single cell measures is brought out by quite well, I think, by this figure uh, from, from a paid review paper by Cole Trapnell. Uh, imagine that, that you are tracking a cellular differentiation process where cell, the yellow cells are in early stages of differentiation, followed by orange, these orange cells as a kind of an intermediate phenotype, and these uh, late stage uh, um, red cells. Now, if you did, if you did these, uh, the traditional bulk gene expression assays over uh, you know, this is a pretty standard kind of time course. Let's say you take snapshots of the system at 24 hours, 48 hours, and 72 hours. At 24 hours, most of your cells are in this yellow state, uh, uh, early stages, maybe one, in or one orange and one red. 48 hours, this is sort of a schematic. At 48 hours, maybe most of the cells are in your intermediate state, uh, the orange, uh, whereas at 72 hours, most cells have transitioned to red, and there are still a couple of stragglers, yellow and orange. What this means is, is that if you do the traditional bulk gene expression assays, whether by RNA-seq, uh, well, I guess nowadays it's mostly by RNA-seq, you will get an average response over a very heterogeneous population, right? Your response will be dominated in the early stages by the yellow cells. In this case, in the, in the 48 hour, you will mostly be capturing by the orange cells, but not exclusively. You have some reds and some yellows, whereas here you will kind of, again, get an average of the mostly red cells. But you're not getting a pure signal. Uh, you, you might get a signal like this, which is sort of the average of the expression at each subsequent step. Now imagine if there were a way to arrange these cells where you still have, you don't, do a, you don't have to do a much more uh, finely resolved time course. 
But if there were a way to arrange these cells along a different trajectory, not this actual time, but along this, uh, let's, say we, let's say we call this a zero time trajectory, where you have the uh, yellow cells, the early uh, undifferentiated cells first, followed by the orange cells in the later, in the intermediate stage, followed by the red cells in the terminally differentiated state, and we're able to arrange them along some kind of pseudo time or time-like axis. Now, if you measure the laid out the gene ex the expression of, of your genes of interest along the pseudo time trajectory, we would get a much more accurate picture of what actually happens during this differentiation cascade. Right? So this would actually show how the how the gene expression pattern changes over this process. Thankfully for us, uh, this problem is being tackled by many groups uh, worldwide, and there are a whole bunch of these so-called pseudo-time uh, trajectory reconstruction algorithms that have been published in the last couple of years. Um, so, uh, uh, so, the, so, so this problem of, of laying out uh, cells along a developmental trajectory, if you have single cell level RNA-seq data or single cell, single cell level flow or mass cytometry data, arranging them along a developmental trajectory is a, is a problem that is being actively worked on. Um, so several algorithms have been, have been developed, um, and this is uh, uh, one, one of these uh, algorithms uh, was developed uh, by Sean Bendow, which is from a cell paper uh, in Cell from 2014, that they followed differentiation of, in the hematopoietic stem cell lineage to B cells. Uh, and so the idea here is that can we detect, uh, again going back to our central message, of can we detect major transitions before they happen? Can we look at critical slowing down in gene expression signatures? So if we were able to, uh, to lay out these uh, zero time trajectories for different genes of interest, for instance here this red gene is, undergoes a, a, a state transition from this highly expressed state to a suppressed state, um, and our, our area of interest is this just prior to this transition, and we would be looking for some sort of predictive biomarker for, uh, for, for uh, or some sort of predictive signature for that gene. Uh, this is the, to, to look at the, whether transitions are coming on or not, this is our proposed workflow. So we collect, we would collect single cell level data at the RNA or uh, protein expression level, take snapshots over time, reconstruct the cellular trajectories, overlay the, the data for marker genes of interest on, that, on those trajectories, and then we would plot the autocorrelation function, uh, sort of along kind of the schematic laid out by Sheffer in his nature paper, and then we would look for sharp changes in the shape of the autocorrelation function. Right, so, so we're proposing this workflow for, uh, to, to look for uh, essentially predictive markers of major cellular transition, whether they are transition of, uh, uh, along the lines of a physiological sort of normal differentiation process or a transition from, uh, from a healthy to an unhealthy phenotype. 